upon the Lord, wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord our God. You reign forever, our hope, our strong deliverer. You are the everlasting God, the Father, we thank you for this beautiful world that we live in and all the things that you've provided for our comfort and our joy. And very soon, the season will shift from green to beautiful autumn colors of crimson, yellow, golds, and reds. And the leaves will fall to remind us that winter is not far off. Father, you have created such a wonder-filled place for us to live. We also thank you for our abundant blessings that are here in the United States where we have freedoms that so many people don't have. And while we enjoy our blessings, remind us to be vigilant in helping those who are less fortunate. We ask you to bless our missions and benevolent activities that we support and help us to all be generous and to guide this church in the use of our resources. Father, we lift up Megan White and Lee Potts, as well as those mentioned in the bulletin. We ask you to guide their doctors and caregivers to bring them comfort and heal them where possible. And Father, we thank you for our elders, our staff and teachers, and Jody and Lisa, all of whom make these services inspirational and bind us together as a church family. Forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And open our hearts and let your radiance surround us. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to welcome everybody. Thanks for coming out to be with us today. We have a lot of people who are gone. We've got a, a seminar going on this weekend uh, uh, on relationships that are a lot of our folks are at. And boy, did they need to go. So, <laughs> how about that? One of the cool things about Twickenham is we have a lot of ages here, from youngest to oldest. And one of our traditions is welcoming our new babies. And we have a new one today, Axel Thomas Dryden and his mom and dad, Jay and Hildy. So you guys come on up, and you guys give him a hand on his way up here. Got a little ball of security there, bro, okay? <laughs> there we go. Now, I think I may have told you this. I don't remember if I told you this or not, but it's okay. So you'll enjoy it the second time around. Um, he was a month early. 
I mean, he w nobody expected Axel to be here when he came, and he came a full month earlier. Not yet. And Hildy said it takes most people nine months to make a human. It only took her eight. She's that efficient. So. <laughs> Let's. He's, he's, he's due tomorrow. Okay, good. <laughs> Kids early about everything. So, all right, let's have a prayer. God, thank you for Jay and Hildy and uh, what they mean to our church. And right now we're so thankful that Axel is healthy. We're thankful that he's here. And we're thankful that he's been born into a family that loves and honors you. And we just, all this gratitude we have for him and for his health and for, for the start that he's getting. We lift up Jay and Hildy. We pray for their marriage. We pray that it will be strong and loving and compassionate and totally centered on Jesus. We pray for them as parents, that you'll give them deep wisdom to know when to speak and when to be silent and when to act and when to wait. We pray that you'd put people into their lives that will uh, encourage them and strengthen them and mentor them we pray that they will be able to raise this little boy in the nurture and admonition of the lord and father we want to be we want to do everything we can as their church to be there for them to assist to support to strengthen and we want axel to see in us jesus so that nothing we ever do or say would give him pause or make him doubt we pray that we will be a strong influence in his life and that we will participate with his family in raising this little boy. We look forward to the day when Axel acknowledges for himself that Jesus Christ is the Lord, the Son of God, and that he gives himself to you in baptism. God, help us do everything we can to make that day possible. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. He raised his hand in the prayer tonight, didn't he? Yes, he has to testify. Brother. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Are we going to get another picture? Okay. While they get a picture, I'm going to say again, welcome to everybody. We are so glad you're here. Thanks for coming out to be with us today at Twickenham. Um, there is a ministry that we have here called PAR. Are you, you guys familiar with that? It's new to me because I'm kind of new to you. But PAR stands for Prepare and Respond. And this is just one of the coolest things. Started in 2011, Twickenham works with a number of other churches to respond to disasters, uh, when there's a, a, a crisis of some kind, a uh, tornado or something like that, volunteers from here and from other churches get together, and they, I have actually seen their heavy equipment. They've got these cool bulldozers and tractors, and they wouldn't let me drive them, but they they have these things on the ready. They're they're brand new. They're just really nice machines. These guys go out and they'll clear roads. They'll cut trees off of houses. They'll put tarps over the roofs when the roofs have been destroyed by the tornadoes. Uh, it's just a group of folks that, that have those skills and use them to the glory of God. And one of, I think one of the neat things about it is that we're working with other churches to do it, so there's that ecumenical piece to it. And we're helping people here in, who are in need. If this is a ministry you'd like to get involved in, just call our church office, and we'll hook you up with Dave Morrell, who runs that ministry here. And we can, we can get you involved in that if you have, have those kinds of skills. This past week, we got an email in the office uh, from Dave that, that there hasn't been a tornado in this area, but there was an elderly woman in Huntsville who had a tree that was doing some, that, that was doing some damage to her house. Some of the PAR folks from here, the Prepare and Response team, went over to her house, cut the tree off her house, and, and just helped her. The really cool thing is that when you and I give on Sundays, that's what we're giving to. They're having a, a golf tournament uh, this Friday to help raise money, but we participate in helping PAR all year round. We, when you give, a part of the money that you give goes to help our prepare and response team prepare so that they can respond when the time comes. The neatest thing about this ministry is that when they go to help people, they never ask them where they stand on any issue. They never ask them where they stand, even on Jesus. They don't do a demographic study. They don't make them fill out a survey of any kind. They just see them as people in need, and they go and help them in the spirit and love of Jesus. 
It's like that passage says, when you give a cup of cold water in my name, you'll be blessed. And that's what we're trying to do through PAR. I, I want you to know that, that when the plate passes on Sundays, it's not just going for nebulous things. It's going for real things. One of the things it's going for when you give is ministries like PAR that do a lot of good for a lot of people, regardless of who they are. In fact, let me share a scripture with you. Galatians chapter uh, 3. Why don't you understand? We're going to stand and we're going to hear this passage and then we're going to sing a little bit more. Beautiful passage about what, what really is important. So, in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Now listen to this. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free. There is neither male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Let's praise him as brothers and sisters. Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. Can move the mountain. 
unsearchable wealth and the wonder of knowing your voice. You are our treasure and our great reward, our hope and our glorious King. How high and how wide, how deep and how long, how sweet and how strong is your love. How lavish your grace, how faithful your ways, how great is your love, O Lord. How high and how wide, how deep and how long, how sweet and how strong is your Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Come thou fount of every blessing, to my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me ever to adore thee, may I still thy goodness prove, while the hope of endless glory fills my heart with joy and love. Here I raise my Sons and daughters kneel at the throne of grace. Losers and winners, saints and sinners, one day we'll see his face. And we all bow down. The kings will surrender their crowns.
Good morning. <clears throat> um, last night, and really since Wednesday, when Lincoln asked me to share communion, I've been struggling with um, what to say. And uh, this is um, basically what uh, I feel like God has placed in my heart. Um, this last Tuesday night, uh, going into Wednesday night, was uh, the most um, holy calendar year for the Hebrews, for the Jewish nation. It's called Yom Kippur, which is also known as the Day of Atonement. Um, that, back in the temple and tabernacle days, was the one day that the high priest would be allowed to enter into the Holy of Holies and give a sacrifice, uh, a sin offering, for uh, the entire Israeli or Hebrew uh, nation. Um, it did not just end there, though. It's also known as a day of, of repentance, of... Um, uh, it's a, just a time of, of reflection uh, of, of your life and, um, you know, how you're connected with God. Um, the reason I, I share this is because now we have our own high priest, right, Jesus, who is... Uh, in front of God, we basically have every day as a Yom Kippur. Um, we have uh, a, a priest who has, through his blood, um, stood before the Father uh, to cover us. I'm going to read Hebrews uh, chapter 9, verses 11 and 12. But when Christ came as a high priest of the good things that are not now already here, he went through the great the greater and the more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands, that is to say, it is not part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once and for all by his own blood, thus obtaining an eternal redemption. What a blessing it is that we have uh, this time set aside to reflect on uh, the fact that he has uh, sacrificed for us and is in front of the Father each and every day. If you would bow with me. Father, we come before you now in awe of who you are. And we pray that your kingdom come to this earth as it is there in heaven. And we pray that it dwells in our hearts. And Father, we thank you for your son Jesus, our high priest. And we are grateful for the sacrifice that he allows, that this allows our pardon. Father, I pray for a conviction and a revelation of anything that hinders us from your blessing. And Father, as we take this bread and drink this cup, I pray that we do it with a soft heart, confessing our need for you more and more each and every day, and less of us. In your son's name, amen.
God, again, we uh, want to come before you uh, with a humble heart, thanking you for this cup that represents your son's blood that allows him to stand before your throne uh, in, in, in our place. And God, we just thank you so much and are in awe of who you are, and it's in your son's name. of heaven God's own son to purchase and redeem and reconcile the very ones who nailed him to that tree oh that rugged cross my salvation This is my 
Turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter uh, 3, 2, I, I, I know, I know, where, is, where are we this morning? 1 Peter chapter 2, we're going to go into 3, 1 Peter's uh, toward the back of the Bible, you start in the back, just kind of go back this way, 1 Peter chapter 2, and then we'll get to chapter 3, if I were a religious skeptic, somebody who approaches Christianity and the Bible from a place of doubt and suspicion, and I read the passage that we're going to work, do some work in this morning, it would move me deeper into doubt. It would, might even move me closer to outright disbelief. If I were a militant atheist, somebody like Sam Harris or Richard Dawkins, this is one of the passages that I would, I would use as ammunition against Christian belief. The text that we're going to explore this morning is by today's standards, politically incorrect, gender insensitive, racially offensive and discriminatory by today's standards it reinforces stereotypes it perpetuates injustice and ignores violence against marginalized people some folks have called this text and others like it a terror text it should come with a trigger warning some Christians have even used this text and others like it to defend and perpetuate unjust practices like slavery and the suppression of women's rights. Which is why many more Christians look at a passage like this and more or less Treat it like the Confederate flag of the Bible. We are not real excited about running this one up the flagpole and asking everybody to salute it as the Word of God. We, we treat this passage a little bit like that cousin in your family that nobody wants to talk about. You cannot deny they're part of the family. You just hope to goodness they don't show up for the reunion. You're thinking about them right now, aren't you? Yeah, some of them are here. So, but, but here it is. I mean, we're going to read it, and we're going to read it. It's all in black and white, and it's, it's from an apostle of Jesus. It's from Peter. So I, I hope you understand that I'm, that I'm trying to be really honest about the awkwardness of this passage. But at the same time, I'm going, to, I'm going to go ahead and raise the degree of difficulty for us here. I want to affirm that this is the inspired word of God. This is truth. This is relevant. You can't take an exacto knife and cut this out of your Bible and be okay with God. It's in there. And it does offer some guidance on how to live like exiles. How to live like Jesus in a, in a world that doesn't really do that anymore. So here's how we're going to handle this difficult passage. First, we're just going to hear it in its entirety. It's more than I like to try to handle in one sermon, but there's not a real good place to break this up. So what I'm telling you is, I think I told you this last Sunday too, there's some hard stuff in First Peter. You're going to have to do a little work with me this morning, okay? I'm, this is going to be sort of one of those another one of those sermons that requires you to really dig in okay so we're going to read read the whole thing and then we're going to ask three questions 
what kind of person would write this? What kind of person would write something like this? And then how did the original readers hear it? And then the last question we'll, we'll go with is, is what is God's word to us? Okay? So, here we go. Put your crash helmets on. Buckle up. You guys in the balcony ready? Are you guys in the balcony ready? Chapter 2, I'll begin in verse 11. And we're going to read down to chapter 3, uh, verse 7. So, dear friends. I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans. That right there is offensive. That though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Submit yourselves to the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who were sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. I will remind you that the person who was sitting on the throne in those days was not a socially conservative Republican. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone, love the family of believers, fear God, honor the emperor. Slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness by his wounds you have been healed for you were like sheep going astray but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls chapter 3 verse 1 Just, it doesn't get any better okay <laughs> wives in the same way submit yourselves to your own husbands so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Your beauty should not come from outward adornments such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her Lord. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Wow. Who decided 1 Peter was a good book to study? Let's just go ahead and get into this. Question number one. What kind of person would write such a thing? I mean, there's so much in here to be offended about from, from our cultural point of view. I mean, there, uh, there are at least a dozen political infractions in this section. So who would write something like this? Well, I mentioned earlier, he was an apostle, Peter, and he wasn't just an apostle. This is not some backbencher like, I don't know, Bartholomew. Okay, this is Peter, the lead apostle. He's the guy that, the, the first one to confess that Jesus was the Son of God, the, the Christ that was promised from, uh, from the prophets. The first one to say that. Peter was the one that walked on the water for a few steps. 
that he did it. Peter is the one who preached the first gospel sermon. If you, you don't have to turn there right now, but Acts chapter 2, when the, the day the church is established, on the day of Pentecost, Peter was the guy who preached the very first sermon after the resurrection of Jesus. And, and if you look back earlier in 1 Peter, uh, the first couple of verses, the cities that he mentions there, some of those cities are mentioned in Acts 2 as having people present on the day of Pentecost. So the likelihood is that, the, that some of the people to whom this letter is addressed were there on that first day of, Pente- the, first day of Pente- uh, the first day of the church at Pentecost, and they heard Peter preach. So this is, this is a, a really influential individual in the kingdom of God. Jesus said, you know, the keys of the kingdom and all of that. This is not an insignificant person. This is a major, major character. But there's one other thing I think we need to know about Peter, the author of what many would consider to be offensive language here in, in this book. Peter was a bit of a barrier breaker in the early church. Uh, there's a story in Acts chapter 10. There was a guy named Cornelius who was a, a Roman centurion. He was a Gentile, and because he was a Gentile, the Jews wouldn't have anything to do with him. They respected him because he was very generous to the poor. He prayed all the time. He was attracted to the Jewish religion, probably because of its high morality, but he could never really become a Jew, a full-fledged Jew, a, a member of the synagogue. He wasn't welcome in their synagogue. They respected him, but he was a good guy. One day, Cornelius, uh, who was stationed in Caesarea, was praying, and an angel appeared to him. And the angel, the, the message the angel had was basically, Cornelius, God has noticed you. you you're a good guy. We want to honor your prayers and your righteousness and your goodness. So we're gonna want you to, we want you to send to the city of Joppa, and there's a guy named Peter. We want you to bring him back because he has a message from God for you. So Cornelius calls a couple of his guys in and he says, I want you to go to Joppa, find a guy named Peter and bring him here. And they say, yes, sir. So they take off. The next day at noon, Peter is in Joppa and he's staying at the house of a guy named Simon the Tanner and he's in prayer. And and it's kind of funny, the Bible says that he was hungry because it's lunchtime. And so people are downstairs fixing lunch. Peter is up on the roof, he's hungry and he's praying and he has a vision, kind of like Cornelius, except his is a little more difficult to understand. In Peter's vision, this sheet comes down out of heaven, and inside the sheet are all kind of animals. And this voice says, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Now, you remember, right, that the Jews had all of these dietary restrictions they had to follow there were certain things they weren't allowed to eat because they were they weren't necessarily bad for you but they were ceremonially unclean like pork for example they couldn't eat pork so this the sheets full of all these unclean animals and the voice says peter rise kill and eat and peter goes i have never touched anything unclean lord and and and, the, and god says to him do not call anything impure or unclean that god has called clean that vision happened three times it, it, over and over and over again, it happens three times, and every time the voice says, don't call anything impure or unclean that, that God has declared clean. So finally, the, the vision ends, the third vision ends, and Peter's up there trying to figure out what this means and thinking, maybe I can have a ham sandwich. I don't know. And then there's a knock at the door. And Peter goes down, and here are these three guys. And they say, our boss sent us to bring you to Caesarea. So he goes with them. And I want you to look, it says in Acts chapter 10, uh, you can look on the screen, We're not gonna, you don't have to turn there, but I want you to see the first thing that Peter says when he walks into Cornelius' house. Talk about how to, how to open up. You are well aware that it's against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile. That is not how I would lead. That's not, that's not the first thing I would say. But then look at what he says. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. And then he says, why, why did you bring me here? And Cornelius tells him his vision that I, that I, there's a man, you're supposed to come and give me a message from God. Here's your money quote from Acts chapter 10, verse 34. Peter says, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. 
So what we, what we just read in 1 Peter seems to at least be in some tension with the man who said that. I mean, we're not talking about a first century Lester Maddox or George Wallace or J.B. Stoner here. Peter did not stand on the steps of the church and block the entrance of the Gentiles. Peter is the guy who kicked the door in and brought him in. In fact, in Acts chapter 11, he's hauled down to Jerusalem, and they say, what's all this business about you out there teaching the Gentiles and baptizing them? And Peter tells the whole story again, and then the apostles and, and, and the leaders in Jerusalem go, well, praise the Lord, the Gentiles have received the gospel. And everybody goes, woo, and they start spreading it everywhere. So Peter's a huge barrier breaker here. So if, if, if Peter is a guy that, that, that was into breaking barriers, not reinforcing them, maybe the second question can help us a little bit. How do the original readers hear these words? And that seems like an appropriate question to ask, right? If, if we read this and just think about how offensive it is from our cultural point of view, if we don't try to look at it from their point of view, isn't that so much chronological snobbery and cultural arrogance i mean i think that's the way it works these days so what was it like in their culture how would they have heard this well these were these were powerless people some of them were slaves some of them were women both of those groups slaves and women in that culture were at the bottom of the social pyramid in greco-roman society Roman society, Greco-Roman society was, was structured on a pyramid. The top, you had the, the imperial family. And then you had the, the, the senatorial class with all of the, the, the senators, 300 senators, and then former senators and their families. And then the equestrian class, landowners, wealthy folks who were patricians or fathers. And then you got into the, the plebeians, the merchants, the soldiers, the artisans. And in, in every level, it just keeps going down until you get down to slaves. Every human grouping in Greco-Roman society was shaped like a triangle. And at the top of every one of them was the patriarch, or the oldest male, and then the younger males, and then the oldest women, and then the younger women, and then the children, and then the slaves. Family, business, farm, government, didn't matter. Everything was shaped like a pyramid, and slaves and women were always, always, always on the bottom. They had no rights. They had no status. There was no acronym to which they could appeal for somebody to come in and help them. They couldn't go on the internet and claim victim status and gain power that way by gaining sympathy from a lot of people. Nobody set up GoFundMe sites for slaves and women. Absolutely powerless. If you were a woman in that culture, you inherited your father's status. And you, and you stayed there unless you somehow married up both of those groups, women and slaves, were dependent on the goodwill of people with more power. So when Peter addresses them in verse 11 as friends, that's huge. The word actually in Greek is beloved. Peter calls them beloved and he has already called them brothers and sisters he's called them children of god he's called them redeemed he's called them chosen he said you're a royal priesthood he said you're a holy nation you're a people belonging to god and now he calls them beloved clearly two things here number one he doesn't think he's better than they are peter writing to the slaves and the women does not think he is better than they are because of all the things that he's already called them and second, he clearly has some affection for them. But I want you to notice something else. He addresses them as people who are free to choose a response. Three times, and this is a, we hate this, we hate it, we hate it. But three times he says, submit yourselves. Now we are totally not in, into submission in our culture. We don't do submission. Not in, not in the United States of God bless America. We do not do submission. We do rights. I have my rights. 
I have a right to this and a right to that. And if you try to deny me my right to this, this is my body. I get to do with, what, do with it whatever I want to. You can't deny me my rights. We don't submit. We just don't. But in their culture, that's all they did. Now, the cool thing here is that Peter addresses them, the slaves and the women, the powerless people. And you didn't do that back in those days. If you wanted people to submit, you addressed whoever their superior was. So he would have said to masters, make your slaves submit. He would have said to men, make your wives submit. But he doesn't do that. He talks to them. That didn't happen in that culture. And the really crazy thing here is he gives them reasons for submission. He gives them reasons. You don't do that to people you don't respect. If you don't respect somebody and you tell them to do something, the reason is because I said so. If you don't respect somebody, the reason you give them is, and you tell them to do something, the reason you give them is because I'm the boss, because I have the authority. But Peter gives them reasons. One of them is in verse 15, vindication. And you don't think they, they, they kind of grinned when they heard this. They probably grinned and looked around to see if anybody was looking. It is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the talk, the ignorant talk of foolish people. Silence the ignorance of the fools by being good. Now, if you're a powerless person and you get a letter from an apostle of Jesus Christ who says, I need, you to be, I need you to do good, to submit and do good so you can silence the ignorant fools that are talking about you. Man, that's empowering. He's given you a reason. And then the second one is evangelism. That's in verses 12 and then chapter 3, verse 2. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father, on the, our God, on the day he visits us. And in chapter 3, verse 2, you, you women who are living with pagan husbands, you live such good lives that you can, without even a word, he will see something in your life and he will want to know what in the world. Do you, you, you should be miserable and you're not. What in the world do you have? And he'll want to have what you have. You can, without a word, win somebody. Vindication, evangelism, and then the third, one is identif- the third reason he gives them is identification with Jesus. Chapter 3, verse 21, to this you were called because Christ suffered. Look, if you're a slave and you're suffering, and you would have been suffering in that culture, if you're suffering in that culture and Peter says to you, let me tell you something, when you suffer, you are being just like Jesus, the Son of God. That was tremendously empowering to those people. That's how they would have received it. That's how they would have heard it. It sounds offensive to us, but look, We're people with power. We're people with resources. We're people with access. We're people with all kind of influence. Those people would have heard that completely different. Peter is empowering them, telling them how to live a Christian life in a very, very difficult situation. Okay, last question. What's God's word to us in this? It's a little little difficult to make this transition because we're not in their situation. But let me share two things with you here that I think we can take away from this. Here's the first one. Your earthly status has no bearing on your spiritual identity, or your status does not disqualify you before God. Your status does not disqualify you before God, nor does it qualify you. Your earthly status has no bearing on your spiritual identity. To the people around them, Peter's audience was made up of social cellar dwellers. To God, they were sons and daughters of the king. To the people around them, Peter's audience was populated by powerlessness people and by positionless people. To God, they were priests in the royal kingdom. There's a reason why your status neither qualifies nor disqualifies you. Your social status neither qualifies nor disqualifies you in the kingdom of God. That's because in the kingdom of God, human points don't count. Human points don't count. Here's what I mean by that. We are, in, we are incessant scorekeepers. Okay, i got to say something to y'all. I walk, into the build, I walk into the building, and I am exchanging oxygen for carbon dioxide or however it goes. I'm just breathing. And I've got 
Auburn and Alabama fans coming up to me going, well, look at you. I haven't done anything. Ooh, I think I just touched on a nerve there. Did I not? Maybe. I'm just not breathing. We're such scorekeepers. We love to keep score. We keep score in every conceivable way possible. We, we, we measure how much money we have. We are always trying to get to the top of the heap or look like we belong there. It's cars, it's houses, it's whatever. In Peter's world, it was all about which level of the pyramid you lived at. If all you could be was a farmer, you wanted to farm your land, not somebody else's. If you were a slave, then you wanted to be a house slave, not a field slave. No matter how low your position, you always wanted to be at the top. We keep score too, we just use different measurements, a different point system. Washington, D.C., it's all about power. Do I have more than you? Do I have more influence than you? In Atlanta, where I spent 30 years, I'm telling you, it's all about money. Do I have more of it than you? In Nashville, from what I can tell, it's about two things, talent and looks, talent and appearances. And if you can't have one, you better have the other. In Huntsville, with all the engineers, I don't think it's about appearances. <laughs> Two words, pocket protectors. <laughs> Some of you are wearing one right now. But you know what does matter here in Huntsville? Intelligence. Am I smarter than you? In the kingdom, in the kingdom, None of those points count. So in Atlanta, you can be poor. And in Nashville, you can be plain. And in D.C., you can be powerless. And in Huntsville, you can be slow-witted. And you will still be valued and loved and cherished in the kingdom of God. It does not count. Human points don't count. So if they don't count with God, should they count as much with us? That's the first takeaway. Here's the second one. Your, this is going to be hard. Your circumstances do not exempt you from the mission. Your circumstances do not exempt you from the mission. This is going to really sound harsh. Peter's writing to slaves some of whom are subject to violent treatment, subject to God knows what kind of horrible abuse. And he tells them they still have a mission to fulfill. Despite whatever awful treatment they're enduring, they still have both the opportunity and the duty to represent Christ to the world. Now, I'm just going to acknowledge my privilege here. This is an easy thing for me to say. I am white, I am male, I am young, I am healthy. And thanks to God and to you, I'm, I'm blessed in a, with an awesome church and in a great situation. I live at the foot of a mountain, a mile from a river, and the leaves are about to change. It does not get any better. But when I am old and sick and broke or alone, or whatever state I am in, I hope that I will still be on mission. No matter where you are in life, if you are a Christian, you and I are to be about the Lord's business, accomplishing his will, fulfilling his work. We never retire. We never are finished. We do this as long as we breathe, no matter why. I think that's God's word to us today. One more, I didn't include this for our slide folks, but I, I do want you to look at one more passage here right at the very end. It's in chapter 3, verse 8, and it's a, a great way to end. Finally, all of you, be like-minded. If we're all focused on the mission, we're like-minded. Be sympathetic. Because we're not all in the same place, status-wise. Some of us are very well-resourced. Some of us are barely getting by. 
Some of us are enjoying the greatest of health. Some of us have a diagnosis that we're not sure how long we're going to live with. Some of us are in amazing marriages. Some of us are barely making it. So be sympathetic. Love each other. Love one another. Be compassionate. And again, because we're not all at the same place status-wise, be humble. Be humble. Great words. Let's close with a prayer. Father, thank you for this amazing passage, this difficult passage. We're thankful that it requires some work of us, that we have to think about it, that it challenges us, that it stimulates and stretches. These are hard words, words that don't seem to fit in our culture. So we pray that we would be humble enough to hear them with the ears of their first listeners, to read them with the eyes of the first readers, to put ourselves in their circumstance and to realize how much harder they had it than we. And that they were called to stay on mission no matter what, how much more responsible must we be? How much greater is our duty? How much higher is our opportunity? We pray, Father, for those this morning that are struggling in their lives. We pray for your peace, your strength, your power. And we pray that even in the midst of their struggle, their pain, their heartache, they will stay on the mission. We pray that all of us will do so. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you need our prayers this morning, if you want to give your life to Christ in baptism, you are welcome to come forward. Let's stand. Let's sing. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen. the glory of the risen King. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. You're my Savior. You can move the mountains. God, you are mighty to save. You are mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, you rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. If you remain standing for just a minute for some closing announcements. Um, just got a few announcements. Uh, four weeks from now, we're going to have a men's retreat, and it's going to be here um, Friday night and Saturday morning. This is one of those opportunities where um, this is a wonderful opportunity to invite neighbors, coworkers, men that you work with. Um, and I've already invited the men from the way, an organization we support. And so this is the time to fill this place with men. Um, the details are up there. Uh, Rick Reynolds is, is definitely an expert in what he's talking about, but he has a style that will, will draw you in, and it will be a non-threatening way to bring people in here. Uh, the Par Golf Tournament is this coming Friday. If you um, want to put together a team or if you want to play on a team and just need a place to fit in, there are details here and in your bulletin as well as how to connect. As Jody said, it, it's just a wonderful thing that we're a part of with Par. It is, it's really neat to go to a place where a tornado is just ripped through and see a trailer with the Rock's name on it and with Judson Baptist and with Harvest Baptist and with Twickenham Church of Christ. And you realize that Christ is bigger than these problems they're going through and Christ is bigger than the divisions we create. And it's just a wonderful thing to be a part of where he is uplifted and people are 
are searched and, and helped because of him. And lastly, next Sunday morning, instead of our normal Bible class, we're going to have a special follow-up to the uh, survey that we took last year. I guess it's a sort of a state of the church opportunity where you can see what we've done since last fall and what we're going to be doing. So this is a great chance to get feedback from the elders as well as um, to offer your opinion and insights to them as well. You'll, you'll be very much informed of what's going on, what has happened. Obviously in the last year we've added six wonderful elders and a wonderful preacher, but much more than that has gone on. So this will be a chance for you to learn that and to see where we're headed. Let's pray together. Father God, the heavens declare your glory and the skies proclaim your work, Father, without even saying a sound, without, without words. Father, we hope uh, this morning as, as we have made our attempts to praise you with our words, Father, and with our actions that uh, it has been just as pleasing to you as, as what we see every day in, in your creation. God, we're thankful to have been here this morning to, uh, to experience the singing, to, to experience the joy in song and in prayer. And in Jody's lesson, Father, we're, we're thankful that uh, you don't count our worth by our status, that you don't uh, place our, uh, our status uh, in your kingdom uh, based on, Father, what we uh, can give in return. God, we're also thankful that we have a mission, no matter what our circumstance in life, Father. We pray that as we go forth this week, uh, that we'll see our mission clearly and uh, that we will uh, shine the light, uh, Father, to everyone that we see. God, we're so thankful for Jesus. Uh, we pray that the day will be soon that he comes to take us home to be with you forever. It's in his name we pray. Amen.